Wiki, or as she calls herself, Lo, is a blogger on a mission to break down big information and share it with the world in an easy to understand way. She writes about health, fitness, sustainability, travel, and more personally, about her life with narcolepsy. Lo brings with her a creative millennial spirit that helps others understand the ins and outs of narcolepsy while educating and inspiring others to live full and happy lives. Okay, so when did you realize um, that you were suffering from narcolepsy? I was diagnosed my junior year of college, but we were, were super unsure of when I actually got narcolepsy. My mom thinks that it could have been ever since I was a baby because I would sleep through concerts and everything, but it was just like, oh, we just have a good baby. Uh, growing up, it was just, oh, she's a growing kid. She's tired in high school doing sports and after school classes. It was like, well, she's super busy. So she's tired. And then in college, when my schedule wasn't as chaotic as it was in high school, and I did have a bit more free time and I was just still so exhausted that my mom kind of thought maybe we should just get it looked at just to kind of rule anything else out. So I went to my uh, general doctor and they, she had me do a sleep apnea test just to rule that out, as well as a few just other blood tests to see if maybe I just have a vitamin deficiency that could be causing my excessive sleepiness. And when we ruled all of that out, she was like, okay, the next step is to go see a sleep specialist. So after a couple more things to rule it out, because they don't want to automatically jump to narcolepsy because the only there's no cure, it's only just symptom management. So they didn't want to test me for narcolepsy and then have to put me on a drug when it might not be narcolepsy. So we tried ruling out everything else beforehand. And then finally I did an overnight and the next day sleep study. So they had me there overnight. They made me take a bunch of naps the next day. And when they got back all my results, cause I had electrodes and mm -hmm. everything. And when they got back my results, they were super in line with narcolepsy to where my going to REM sleep super quickly and stay there for most of the night. So, which is essentially how narcolepsy looks on these brain scans. So in doing that is how they determined that it was narcolepsy, but we don't actually know at what point it may have started if I was born with it, or if it was something that I got in middle school, because I did get strep a lot. And they do say that sometimes having a virus like strep or flu can trigger the autoimmune response in your brain. So you can get it later on in life after having a virus. So we are unsure of when exactly it started, but I was diagnosed uh, my junior year of college. Okay. And so what was the experience like? Um, I guess in a lot of ways, I assume that there was probably a little bit of frustration um, prior to being diagnosed your junior year of college. You had mentioned that like as a child, you'd sleep through concerts and take a lot of naps and so forth. Um, was that like really frustrating, you know, not knowing maybe or not knowing what it was, if it was anything? It was frustrating, especially in high school, because again, kids always take naps. So it was kind of like scheduled into my day as a kid to take a nap anyway. But then in high school, when people were coming over and it's also in a sense, I'd have to like, if I were doing something in the evening, just kind of like mentally prepare myself to be like, okay, let's store up a little bit of energy earlier in the day so I can make it throughout the evening. And one event in particular was my 18th birthday and I was throwing a surprise party. So my aunt took me out in the morning with her and my cousin, they took me shopping. So all morning we were busy walking around doing a bunch of things. And I thought I would just get to go home and rest because I was pretty tired after, after that. And then when I got home and there were all of my friends there, it was like overwhelming because I was just was mentally prepared for, I'm going to take a quick nap. I was spent all this morning doing something and then to have them there and I actually fell asleep at my own birthday party. So for a while, my aunt thought, well, maybe she has depression because she's just like tired. So they kind of thought maybe it was more um, mental health, but I wasn't struggling with that. So I was like, no, like I'm fine. I'm just exhausted all the time. And I think that was kind of the first red flag that, oh, something's actually wrong because she has a bunch of friends at her house for her birthday and she can't even stay awake to be around them. So I think that was kind of the first uh, major sign as well as in high school 
one of my teachers called my mom. She was like, she's falling asleep and all like, she keeps falling asleep in this class. Like, I don't think I'm that bad of a teacher. Uh, so she kind of raised a red flag as well. But my mom just, again, we pushed it off as well. I'm doing sports and I'm doing after school classes. So we didn't think too much of it. And then in college, again, I would just be driving with my friends places and I would feel myself being in the cars, uh, especially hard when I don't take one of my medications or after 9 p.m. because I could feel myself like falling asleep behind that. So then that's when I was kind of like, okay, I shouldn't be driving. Like this is Mm -hmm. pretty hard. So it was a combination of those things that finally took me to ask my doctor. Yeah, absolutely. So what does quote unquote narcolepsy look, look like for you, um, you know, now like on a regular basis and like kind of what does um, an episode look like? You know, there's also cataplexy. There's a lot of different variations or components that go into quote unquote having narcolepsy and like what an episode is. So I guess, can you just share a little bit about that? So for me, I was not diagnosed with narcolepsy with cataplexy because I wasn't having the intense physical reactions, um, but I still do feel it in a slight sense. So right now my day-to-day is completely normal. I live a relatively normal life as long as I take my medication and I take it on time. Uh, There have been situations where at work we had to do a target run and I also, for my medication, can't take it 30 minutes before or after eating just so I can get the full effects. And we were going to get food on this while we were out. So I thought, okay, I won't take my medication. I'll just take it when we're back. And this trip took longer than expected. So by the time it was 2 p.m., for me, it feels like my body gets really heavy, almost like I have a weighted vest on me and I just need to sit down. Like my legs can't hold me up. So almost in the sense of when you see somebody with cataplexy, but that's usually in uh, an emotional response to something where things just kind of crisscross and get haywired. But for me, it's just like that heavy sense of I need to sit down because like I can't get myself to move much more. So that is how it feels if I don't take my medication, but day to day taking my medication, I live a relatively normal life. Which is wonderful. And so when you um, take this medication, what, what do you mean by you have to take it at a specific time? So like, do you take it, I mean, I'm, and do you take it like three times a day? Do you have to take it like right when you wake up and right before you go to bed or kind of how does that work? And are there like, you know, side effects? I mean, I, I'm on medication myself, but you know, are there things that you experience as a result of the medication? Uh, so for me, I do take one right when I wake up which my doctor also says I should have a regular wake up schedule just to keep my sleep schedule consistent, even on the weekend. Can't say I've been too great about that lately, uh, but typically I'll wake up around seven, take my first one as soon as I'm up and then not eat anything for at least 30 minutes afterwards, which usually I'm not super hungry for breakfast anyway. And then the second one I need to take around lunchtime. So I have the app, uh, I have an app on my phone that reminds me to take it. So at 1230, it'll say like time to take your medicine. But if I'm no, I'm going to eat something at 1245, then maybe I'll either take it at like 1215 or I'll just wait until after I eat and take it around 130. So I try not to take it any later than 130 because then I feel like I start crashing too much that it can't bring me back up. But if I take it between 12 and one or 130, it kind of keeps me up keeps me at a steady pace for the rest of the day. Of course. And so with this quote unquote, like rigid, I want to say rigid, but you know, you have a schedule for your medication and, you know, to make sure that you, you know, you're up to par and that, you know, you're not getting tired and, you know, maybe falling asleep or need to take a nap. Um, how does that affect you? Like in terms of like scheduling? So like, it's, let's see, it's one o'clock there for you, one o'clock there for you. So Anyways, 12, 15, 1230, you already had to take, <laughs> obviously you already took it. Um, but... I actually have it and have it sitting next to me because um, oh. I ate right before this. So I'm oh, okay. So no, 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 I'm just time. saying, okay. So, and I don't mean, but I'm just yeah. saying like it affects, like, how does it affect like certain things that you do? Like, you know, obviously whether it be going out to lunch with friends, you have to say that you have to go at a specific time or like, cause obviously not everything can be as, I mean, you can take a medicine anytime, you know, but um, cause obviously, yeah, I, I definitely let 
do life first for the afternoon one. So if I was planning a lunch with friends at 1 p.m., then I'll know to take it at 12.30. Or if I was planning a lunch with friends at 12.30, I might even take it at 12.15, knowing that we probably won't get our food till 12.45. Mm -hmm. Um, So I definitely kind of let life first versus saying, oh, no, I have to take it at this exact time. And then not be because had I taken it today at 12.30, and then I would have been able to eat at one, but with mm-hmm. this, then I wouldn't be eating till after this. So I'd rather eat first and then take this in five minutes. Right. No, absolutely. Um, so do you ever experience um, night terrors or like lucid dreams, which is like, obviously when like, you know, one, um, one is dreaming um, clearly like while they're asleep. So like, how's your sleep? I mean, yeah. How do you sleep? Quote unquote. <laughs> If that so, makes any sense. Before I was diagnosed, I actually did have a lot of sleep paralysis and didn't really know what it I knew it was sleep paralysis, but I didn't know why I had was experiencing so much. And just like that feeling of like somebody in my room and I can't do anything about it. And there have been a few times where I think I like did while at home, like did manage to get a scream out and like my mom would come in and it'll only be. 10 30 at night. Cause I'm barely going to sleep. So I did experience it a lot then now less so. Um, but I do know in the mornings when I wake up and I like really remember my dreams or I know that I dreamt a lot. I kind of know that I'm going to be more tired during the day since REM sleep is when you're dreaming. And when you're in REM more, your brain is wide awake, even when your body is completely asleep. So I kind of know Oh, if I dreamt a lot last night, then my brain was definitely awake. So I'll probably be a bit more tired today. Got it. Got it. Perfect. Um, and so I guess what is, what has been one of the biggest obstacles, um, with your narcolepsy that you've had to face and how have you, uh, overcome that obstacle? I think for me, it's with driving. So working as a freelance producer, there are a few things that I do that will go until later at night. Um, thankfully I'm super close with one of the executive producers. So I'll be able to tell him like, if this is going to go past 9 PM tomorrow, let me know on Uber and then I'll get a ride back. Or if it's something that might go to 9 30, I'll say, Hey, is it possible if I leave 30 minutes early, like, or do you actually need me? So he kind of knows that I'm able to have discussions with the people that I'm working for to say, this is my cutoff time. I don't feel safe being behind the wheel of a car at 9 PM. So just let me know what I need to do because I can easily be awake and finish my job at 930. But as soon as I'm behind the wheel, just for some reason, it makes it so much worse. So I'll just have to know, okay, I'm going to Uber or I'm going to have somebody drop me off afterwards. Right. Okay. And are there like any um, other like limitations that, you know, you're not able to fulfill or do as a result of your narcolepsy? Now, uh, taking medication no beforehand going home from like after high school after class and needing to do a ton of homework and I would be in my room and I would start my homework and I would pass out on my floor and my mom would come and be like oh you took a little nap and then I would have so much anxiety that all this homework didn't get gone because I wasted didn't get done because I just wasted two hours taking a nap so I saw taking a nap when I had so much to do as a waste of time And knowing that I had so much to do, it just kind of gave me more anxiety about everything. So that was definitely hard because they were so unplanned and they would happen so randomly to Mm -hmm. have to work around like, oh no, like I just wasted two hours sleeping. So now knowing, okay, if I do need to take a nap or I'm supposed to take drug holidays, which are days once a week or once every two weeks where I don't take one or either both of my medications, also haven't been too great on that lately, but so I know for those days, okay, maybe I'll schedule in a nap. Maybe I'll do something. Um, so working with that, but taking the medication regularly, I can't say I have too many limitations. Okay. Well, and that's, and that's great. Cause unfortunately, um, I don't think that's the case with everyone. So you're very fortunate in that, um, sense. Um, so, um, what is your favorite recipe, um, that is keto friendly? Ugh. I know that must be difficult to probably, say. um, also just with moving, have not been great on that either. Uh, I would say that 
it's more just like this salad that I love. It's arugula with smoked salmon and nutritional yeast and just like any nut and seed that you have on top with red onion and a bunch of olive oil. Um, really good. It's my favorite. I might even have that today. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds amazing. So um, are there like certain foods um, that you eat um, that like basically help in um, conjunction with your narcolepsy, whether it be with mood, whether it be with um, energy um, and so forth, obviously, in addition to your um, medication, because, you know, foods, obviously, ketogenic diet can be used in so many different manners um, and so forth. Not necessarily. Uh, I'll drink coffee because I like the taste of coffee. I couldn't say that our coffee will get me through the day if I'm with somebody and they're like, well, let's, you know, leave work and go get a 1 p.m. coffee really quickly. I'll go again because I enjoy it. I can't say like, oh, that's afternoon pick me up is helping much at all. Uh, so I can't say any foods in particular help with uh, my symptoms. Okay. So can you um, give us any tips for like healthy sleep um, habits? Definitely sticking to a routine and not having one night where I'm going to bed super late or going to bed super early than the next kind of sticking to aiming to be in bed and hopefully asleep around like 10 30, even 11 and waking up around seven, getting that eight hours. So even if I'm in REM sleep for most of it, it's still good rest for my body. Um, so trying to stick with a good routine and then also, especially when I am at work, I do like wearing my blue light blocking glasses. Um, I'm sitting at a computer a lot lately. I haven't been, so I haven't been wearing them as much, but if I know I'm going to sit in an office under the fluorescent lights all day, I'll usually throw Mm -hmm. those on. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. And so, um, what are some, um, uh, I guess, well, words of wisdom um, that you would give um, others who are struggling with all different types of um, conditions. It doesn't need to be narcolepsy in particular. To be open with it and not to hide it because for me, it's when I don't tell people and then I'm like, oh, I can't do that or I feel too tired to do something late at night or telling somebody that I work for like, oh, actually I prefer if I leave work at 9 p.m. if we're going to be here super late and having to explain it it's easier to be open and explain like this is why I for the safety of me and everybody else it's best if I don't do that or if you want to get the most out of me just kind of like let me know if something's going to be going on later in the evening and I can store up some of my energy earlier in the day so being open open with why has definitely helped and just to not hide or disguise anything because then it just kind of draws like more questions. And then people, at least if you're open, people will kind of understand. And then you can also explain it to them and maybe even show them something new that they didn't know beforehand. It's great advice. And so like, lastly, I didn't jump, I didn't get through every single question, A, because there's, um, some of them are overlaps. Um, but, um, what, what like resources would you offer or suggest to people um, who are newly diagnosed with narcolepsy? There's a, another nonprofit called Project Sleep that I follow and they do a lot of stuff in terms of uh, research and sharing stories as well. Um, so also if you wanted to look for people, they yeah. would be a really, really good resource. Um, and because there are nonprofits, so they also kind of help funding with research and ex- showing what research is out there because it is super underfunded and understudied. Uh, a lot of sleep disorders are. So even if there were a cure or one specific reason as to why, because for narcolepsy, there are so many different reasons as to why it may happen. So not a lot of research has gone into figuring out the specifics and in terms of once finding out the specifics, finding out a potential cure instead of just symptom management. That's, that's a great resource. Well, this has been so great. You're wonderful. 